Okay, choose virtual background. Okay, let it be like this. Hi there, welcome to our webinar. Now we wait for many people that plan to come to us who join us and then we will start. Hi, David. Uh, well, I'm not talking anything right now, <laughs> so I hope that now you can hear me. Let me run some music so that you can hear me what is going on here. Okay, let me... You can also ask some questions. See it here. It's from
tests. Hi there, now we're joining. It's almost three, four of us. So yeah, we'll wait about a hundred person that person that were submitted. Hey guys, you can ask your questions. Questions here. Our chat. There. Hi there again, I think, hi from Australia, <laughs> hi. Uh, hope that everybody is doing okay right now and hope all this stuff that is going on in the, in the world is not affecting you and your families and hope you will be safe and sound. Yeah, hi from Moldova, yeah, hi. Um, okay, um, 
Today we're going to discuss uh, and we would celebrate uh, Apple One's birthday and we're going to discuss how computers work and we discuss what is uh, okay and we would discuss oh yes yeah, Steve is writing to all the panelists okay Sorry, just one moment. Okay. Okay, so let me start. Let me share my screen. I have a presentation and uh, we would follow it. Okay, well, today we have it here. Uh, okay, so today is uh, Apple One birthday and uh, we're gonna uh, first of all, I want to say uh, hello and uh, greetings from everybody from here to the father of Apple One. It's Steve jo uh, Steve Wozniak, and uh, he's uh, hope he he's hearing right now us, and uh, you could greet him in our chat, and uh, he should uh, see it. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous. Sorry that that is why I'm talking not so clear right now. So. Yeah, Woz was an uh, engineer who developed all this. Um, and I read in his story that uh, he didn't have a lot of components when he was dreaming about building his own computer. And he needed to do it uh, on in, in his mind. And also he drew a lot of uh, pictures of, of his designs before he actually got uh, components. And so finally he got a chance to, uh, to do it and to create such a uh, personal computer uh, so people who live in their homes they can uh, get uh, something very modern in that times because in that time uh, computers were like mainframes it was like big 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 uh, rooms uh, full of uh, equipment and uh, frankly you couldn't really imagine that you could have something like this in your own home and so Steve designed uh, such a computer that you can buy and uh, um and use it at home you can uh, do a lot of things with this what is cool about apple one uh we can check it what is what it was in its original uh owner's manual so here's like all the specifications it's uh what is cool it's uh it ran on uh, one megahertz that is not so fast uh, if you know like you have gigahertz in your computer so it's 1000 times more um, by that time it was very very fast it's a million operations kind of a million signals per second so it's very fast so it had the composite uh, video output uh, and uh, what is very specific about apple one that it was text uh, it has text mode so it doesn't have any graphic but it was uh, it has text mode it has eight uh, kilobytes of operating uh, operating uh, memory, so it's a random access memory, and uh, it was a big deal that time because uh, memory was very expensive, and um, it was eight K was very very good uh, that time. Also, I can share with you uh, original uh, Apple One's manual manual how it looked like. Shared. So it's like this. Uh, yeah, it's original Apple One operational manual. So these specifications. Then you get get the introduction. 
uh, schematics because that time it was like uh, the idea was that you are kind of also engineer that you can uh, do something with your computer, you can solder, you can you can repair it if something goes wrong. Uh, it also is, describes how you should uh, start it, and also it uh, has the uh, what now we call user interface. And here's like it was command line. You can enter some commands and get the results and it describes how you should do it. Uh, so uh, basically then you get what is cool. You have operating system and uh, you have listing of this operating system. Now you cannot, couldn't really imagine this that you're gonna have print out of 1 million source code, code lines, uh, but here you can uh, have it here. So it's, it is code originally written by Steve and uh, what is great about this that it just 256 bytes when it's what it is compiled so it's very simple but it's uh, but it's a operating system because it has it, it is a program kind of that uh, manages the resources of the computer so it, it allows you to uh, print something to to display to video controller uh, to get uh, some charts from keyboard and uh, understand commands that you enter you, uh, basically what commands can you do with this uh, operating system is changing memory cells and then uh, write some codes there and then run program, run programs right there. And so also you can see here, it's like schematics uh, for the uh, chips and all at the end, you got the details of how it's done and warranty uh, for sure. Um, okay, let me check what's gonna, yeah. Um, okay guys. Uh, what we have here also is, um, uh, okay, let me ask, maybe we can have some surprise right now. what we can do right now. Okay, uh, what do we have here? And what's really cool that Steve Wozniak is among us and uh, probably he can greet, greet us. Hi, Steve, do you hear me? Okay, do you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Maybe people also would hear you. Good. Hi, guys. I don't know, just a picture. I don't know how to get the video going. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Yes, people, yeah, they hear you. So yeah, you are the father, you are the, the creator, so you are, you are the designer. And uh, maybe you also can tell something, what was, uh, was it what it was about and to build it when computers were just a kind of a dreams of ordinary people. Sure, um, I grew up with talents in the analog electronic world, uh, early ham radio operator and all. And I also then transferred over, somehow picked up digital when it didn't exist and just taught it to myself, never thinking it was a job or a career or anything like that. And I got so enamored with computers and I started training myself in high school how to sit down with a pencil and paper and design the little logic chips that would make a computer because I wanted my own. I knew how they worked and I knew how to toggle switches up and down, ones and zeros. And so, you know, whatever you're good at, that's what you value in life. And, uh, you know, I told my dad I'd own a computer one day when the mini computer systems cost as much as a house. And I said, I'd live in an apartment. So I wanted my computer, but I needed a formula to afford one. I had no money. I had no savings accounts or rich relatives. And uh, I just kept dreaming, you know, when could I ever build a computer? I had taught myself how to build a processor out of smaller chips. Here comes Homebrew Computer Club, and that really was the big change in my life. A lot of people were showing off these mainframe type computers based on a microprocessor, which made them affordable. You know, even if the microprocessor cost $400 single quantity, mm -hmm. I could never afford that. And, the mm -hmm. and what was called a computer cost $400. And it was the elements of a computer, but little does the world know that uh, five years before that, I had built one of these computers with switches and lights for ones and zeros, all yeah. out of small low level chips, all of my own design. 
and it was called the cream soda computer five years before that. I could toggle ones and zeros in and push a button and they'd go into memory and I could build up a program and run it that way. And I don't know, that was so, I was so far beyond it, that was kind of boring to me. I wanted a computer my whole life that could do useful things, meaning, ah, oh, here's a problem or here's a little game or here's a, um, a puzzle that I bought at the store. Can I write a program that solves it for me? And I wanted to be able to write programs and that means you need a programming language and a keyboard and input output was more expensive. You know, by then I knew how to build a processor out of small low level chips. Couldn't quite afford the chips to do it. Single quantity prices, you know, you'd buy a little one NAND gate for like $50 back then, you know, four in a package, but um, it was just too expensive for me. And, and I, now I worked at Hewlett Packard and we had access to chips there and the microprocessor, I learned about the microprocessor. I said, oh my gosh, the whole processor is on one chip. Now the hardest part of computers when I grew up was not understanding how a processor works, how it has registers, it has ones and zeros that make instructions about adding numbers and moving them to memory and stuff like that. The hard part was input output. And I had always schemed way back when I thought maybe I know how oscilloscopes work. I knew all the analog electronics. It was a real key into making the step towards color on the Apple II was understanding all the, how real analog televisions work, analog electronics. So, mm -hmm. so I um, thought when I was very young about maybe, um, gosh, I could send out signals of voltages to an oscilloscope and have it draw patterns. I knew how oscilloscopes work. Mm -hmm. And it was just an idea in my head. Video might be an output, but Pong confirmed it. Pong, here was mm -hmm. Pong, and it actually played a game. It did what some people would call a useful thing in life, and it was a TV set was the output. And my God, I understood all the analog operations of TV sets, their horizontal, vertical rates, how the signals had to be provided to them, what made dots on a screen um, white, what made them black. Understood all this. So um, I'd been building um, equipment using my own television as an output device, which was free. My output was free. I didn't need a, a, a teletype, you know, that could print things out, but it cost as much as two cars. I could never afford that. And so here was the Homebrew Computer Club. And all of a sudden, I saw, my gosh, I'd already built a device that could type away to the ARPANET, computers far away. There were only six computers in the country on this ARPANET, but I could access them from my home over a phone line. And I could talk to a computer with a keyboard. They could talk back to my my television with text, that was usefulness. That was way beyond the cream soda computer and the switches and lights with ones and zeros and the front panel. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh my gosh, I've already got the input output done. The processor is sold, you know, and maybe I could afford mm -hmm. one someday. And it wasn't until the $20 6502 came out that I actually was able to buy a processor you know, mm -hmm. and then I, I, I had trained myself to design things with the fewest parts, but more than that, not just the fewest parts, the fewest complexity, the least complexity and the lowest cost. And the co everybody that was building um, these startup microprocessor kits, like the Altair, they were copying mm -hmm. the Intel data sheet, which showed how to hook it up with a bus and switches and lights. But the only way a data sheet could show a microprocessor connected to RAM was to st expensive static RAM. You ran mm -hmm. a bits from, from the address, the address and data bits on the microprocessor connected to the address and data bits on a static RAM, but it was way too expensive. The dynamic RAM, you know, you needed 4K of RAM to run a computer programming language. And without a language, mm -hmm. I felt my computer was just the cream soda computer, it was not really useful. And I wanted a mm -hmm. useful computer. So dynamic memory was the key and dynamic memory was tricky. It involved engineering to swap in certain addresses on certain cycles of the RAM to make sure it stayed refreshed. And, mm -hmm. but in the end it cut down for 4K of RAM, it cut down from 32 chips to eight chips. See, I saved 24 chips, put in an extra five in to do the refreshing was no problem at all. And I already had counters for going for vertical and horizontal so I could share them. I love using mm -hmm. parts for two purposes at once, share them as refresh addresses. So really I hit on the formula that, um, when you looked at it, it was one board full of chips at the Homebrew Computer Club. That was my inspiration. The way everyone, we all talked like we were on top of a revolution and the world was never going to be the same once people could run, have their own computers. Computer was a special word like, you know, spaceship to Mars. And um, I was so inspired. So I, uh, I hooked this thing together quickly, modified my terminal, 
which was the input output part, added the microprocessor mm -hmm. and memory, which was the brains. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden, and then I, I also had this idea, you don't want to turn it on and start flipping switches. You want to turn it on and enter your data efficiently on a keyboard, a little bit mm -hmm. of program built in when you turn it on. We made calculators at HP. When you turn mm -hmm. them on, they, we didn't have very much memory on them total for, for that, but we had ROMs that started running a program. So the calculator was watching what you were typing. So I said, I'll write a little program that just watches what I'm typing. You got to do the main things that switches and lights used to do on the mainframes. Then that was to store things in memory, to examine what was in memory and to run a program at a certain address in memory. Those three yeah. things that I put it into this, it took, it took actually in those days, we, these were young days, it took me two PROM chips just to have 256 bytes of ROM code. Two chips to add up to 256 bytes. Um, but um, that's what we used to develop programs at Hewlett Packard, so I had the chips and uh, mm -hmm. and that was it. And, and I kind of look back before, every, every computer before that that was trying to be inexpensive was gonna be any computer in the world actually was gonna have switches and lights as a starting point. And every computer after that, it was just obvious when you look down over my shoulders at the Homebrew Computer Club, and I had a board with a certain number of chips that you could estimate the cost was very, mm -hmm. very affordable. Um, you could, um, you know, it, it just, and everyone instantly saw, my gosh, this is the way you can build a computer. Television is the output. Uh, device and it was very important that I understood the analog aspects. I could repair televisions and even color mm -hmm. televisions right out of high school. So I was well trained in both both worlds. So it was easy to cross over from the analog to the digital. And uh, I don't know. And that was so great. I, <coughs> now I didn't want to say, "Oh my gosh, I have a computer and you don't." I wanted to help everyone start a revolution. I was not trying to start a company. And saying I'm going to sell this. Um, Steve Jobs wasn't around. He didn't know about it yet. And mm -hmm. I would um, hand out my schematics to everyone at the computer club. I would mm -hmm. just hand out all my designs and my little 256 bytes of software for starters. I was eventually going to write a basic after. I mean, that was critical mm -hmm. later on. So, so um, that was the idea. It was really to help um, bring this idea that people could be more powerful than independently if they ever had computers. And I thought everybody's gonna get a computer and learn how to program it so they can solve all the problems in their life. And that was really wrong thinking. It was inspired by the inspiration of the club, but um, it, was, it was kind of wrong in the end, but it was still an important step to, um, I don't know, every, every computer after that Apple One had a keyboard and a video display. Yeah. So that was really a changing point in time. And, and I'm kind of glad of that, but um, I really just wanted to help other people instant get this revolution started. Really cool. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So people in, mainly admire what you do. I mean, in, 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 here in chat too, that you kind of try every time you try to reduce the number of chips and reuse them as many times as possible, as you said about with these counters that you use to refresh uh, memory and in general to I had a real genius for designing things very simply and in all, all aspects of my life. And I'd been building project after project like that for, you know, more than five years. And it was just my skill. So um, I wanted other engineers to actually look at my schematics, my designs, my code and say, wow, this he did a really great engineering job. That was what I was after, mm -hmm. not starting a company, not even really starting um necessarily a revolution of the PCs. I really wanted personal notoriety. So and mm -hmm. I'm very thankful that this year I got made a, um, a fellow in the IEEE. That's other engineers giving you their highest honor. Mm -hmm. That's what I was after. That's good. For that's good. That's, I mean, that's, I mean, Apple, I think Apple that's. Cool. And the funny thing is the Apple one was, um, I already had the input output. I had a terminal. I just added the brains to it. So it was really not designed like, I'm gonna design a computer from the ground up. No, it was a quick, hasty project to get done. And then I wrote the basic extremely fast, um, which led, led, you know, a lot of things that I tried to do to, in early and fast days, I made, I would have, if I'd had a little more time or a little more money, I would have done them better. For example, I had an uppercase only keyboard, $60 back in 1974, I think when I bought it. That was a lot of money. I mean, that was more money than the whole rest of the computer. And it was uppercase only as a result, but it was a deal that was offered in Electronic Engineering Magazine or something, EE Times. So, so anyway, uh, 
Um, you know, but, but anyway, I'm glad, but the, the Apple II was really a computer saying, now that I know the formula for a computer, what's the best I can do? Yeah, and then also on, on Apple II, it was like a lot of games and you ran VisiCalc, that is a predecessor of Excel. And so, I mean, it, it was like a real computer that it can use in business and in uh, entertaining yourself. Yeah, like and game, game, games was important for the Apple I and the Apple II. Extremely important. Who's going to buy a computer, put it in your house so you can run um, uh, inventory numbers and sales figures and employment? You don't do that in your home. You need games. That was the key yeah. thing that made a computer fun. And um, I sniffed the wind. And Bill Gates wrote a basic with, with Paul yeah. Allen. And it got famous in our computer club. And I thought, you know, basic is the language. There's a book called 101 Games in Basic. And games were going to be the key to getting people interested in computers. So I'd never programmed in basic, believe it or not. I had programmed in scientific languages like PL1 and Algol and Fortran. So I went into Hill Packard, studied their basic manual and started making, compiling a chart of all the commands, a syntax chart, you could call it in the end. And I just figured out, how am I going to write a language? How do you do it? And I figured out some very logical structures. I'm good at that and wrote my own basic, I didn't realize that Hewlett Packard basic was not the same as digital equipment basic, that all these books on games and all that had been written around. They handled strings of words and strings of letters very differently. So my programs kind of had been modified hugely to run any of the games in books, but I didn't know that. I thought basic was basic. I was that naive, but, um, but I, didn't, I did at least realize that this is going to, having a language is going to be a key to, um, having a useful computer. And when you mentioned things like VisiCalc, that didn't come about on the Apple I. But uh, if it had, it would have been even a revolution back then. <laughs> Nobody could, you can't imagine what you can't imagine, what you don't have and what you've never had. Yeah, so basically you say that, uh, like for the Apple I games, we like, you say, okay guys, you got, you got basic, so kind of kind of a tool. And here's like the, the, the book, like 101 game, uh, games uh, here can uh, just like write the code and they, uh, you got the game. So if you want to play, <laughs> you need to work a little bit and then type all this um, uh, code. But as I said though, yeah, but as I said, it didn't work. Those games didn't work. You'd have to modify them heavily and understand the differences between the Hewlett Packard style basic and the, and, mm. and the uh, digital equipment style basic. So um, basically you can write your own games. You know, you had a machine, you could write your own games. But see, that's far beyond that because before we ever delivered the Apple I, we were actually showing off my Apple II computer. And that was the first time ever that arcade games would be color and the first time in history that arcade games would be software instead mm -hmm. of, you know, hundreds of chips and a thousand wires mm -hmm. with a skilled engineer spending a year to make a new game. A nine-year-old kid could write a game in basic in, you know, one day. But uh, the basic that I was writing was for the Apple I and then, a rid then I transferred over and wrote it so it would work on both machines. Mm -hmm. And use the same uh, CPU, I mean, in Apple II, I mean, like 6502, right? Yeah, th there was a huge difference, though, in hardware by the, by the Apple II, which is the 6502 went up from your specs that you showed of one megahertz operation, approximately, to two megahertz. Mm -hmm. and, the, and yet the processor, the six, uh, I'm sorry, the memory went up to two megahertz. The processor was still at one megahertz, as you showed. So if the memory can do two megahertz, I said, my gosh, by the Apple II, I'll let the uh, processor get in for one microsecond, and then I'll let the video get in for another microsecond. So the video is constantly refreshing it, but it's also getting its own data to show on a screen without having to have extra memory and shift registers and rotating around mm -hmm. like the Apple I. So that was a huge savings too. But uh, you know, it, it all, so many things came together at one time on uh, the Apple II, but the Apple I is still the one that showed the world, here's the formula for the, per the personal computer that's gonna come. Okay, cool. And wouldn't you mind if uh, I show the presentation and you would also comment what I'm showing, I mean, the schematics of computer and Apple I and how it works. Yeah. What do you think? Okay, well, and also guys ask some, uh, some questions here and also. Okay, let me show, oh, no, it's, it's wrong, it's wrong. Sorry, it's just something wrong. Just 
desktop share. Let me call this one. Where is my share desktop? Okay, but why this? I want to share new share this one. Um, keynote, yes. Share keynote. Uh, let me show key, my keynote. Sorry, sorry about this. I want to share my keynote presentation. Ah, it's here. Sorry. That's just showing me again this one. Sorry, guys. Stop share. Sorry, guys. Some. Okay, let me show it. One sec, please. Okay, where is my keynote? It's here. Okay. Expects. Okay, and here we are. This is our Zoom presentation. Yes, so I go there, share. Okay. Uh, you guys see? Steve, do you see the schematics? I do, indeed. Okay, guys. Uh, so I see, a, I see a flow chart. Yeah. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, so here's like a simple schematics of uh, Apple One and basically all all the other computers around the world. Uh, so what it is here, it's like uh, like the brain and the main part of, of every computer is a central processing unit, CPU. In Apple One, it was uh, 6502. Uh, so, but uh, CPU just like need a lot of things uh, to operate. So it needs also some clock rate uh, like generator. So it's a kind of a heart that beats every second for many, many times and provides uh, synchronization for a CPU operating. And then CPU operates with two um, sorts of devices. First is memory uh, where, all the, where all the instructions is saved and data saved. So it, it has two types of memory, like read-only memory, where like Steve told us, uh, his, uh, he um, had his uh, uh, operating system right there. And also it has RAM, random access memory, that is used uh, for programs to operate and to load new uh, programs right there. Also basic was actually put into ROM and uh, it could uh, use RAM to write new programs and execute them. Uh, from the other part, uh, CPU needs to communicate with the uh, with the devices, and so it has uh, to work with the uh, output devices to say something to the world, to show something. And uh, in our case, it's a, a TV set. Like Steve said, uh, it, it is it was cheap. Everybody had it, and you didn't need any anything extra. Now we can also have a TFT screen or something else. Uh, uh, as an output device. Uh, also, the, the other sort of devices is input uh, devices where you need to get some information uh, to be typed in by a user. So it could be keyboard, PS2, or S key, or uh, Bluetooth, uh, or anything else, uh, or touch screen, everything would be input device. So uh, processor works with this, uh, with the, uh, uh, it's called so-called ports, so it can write to it and read from, from these ports, given the address of every port. Uh, to work with all these uh, devices, uh, it needs just a kind of a signals and special uh, control signals. Um, and here it's like the main uh, signals that uh, CPU uses is like read and write, and so it uh, shows to the devices outside him what he, he gonna do. And uh, to make this, he uh, uses his address bus. We're going to show it here in just like on the next slide. And also, um, and then it, it is decoded by a port decoder for a port uh, to understand what which port uh, processor uh, just has chosen. And uh, for memory, it also needs to, to be chosen uh, because every uh, memory has its physical presence uh, in, in some form of chip. So processor doesn't really know how many chips you have at eight or 24 or something like this, but uh, hardware of a computer, it just um, orchestrates and works all this. Uh, so what, 
um, yeah, and here we are. We have it here like uh, uh, our version of the Apple One that we presented at CES. Uh, so it's like everything is uh, very straightforward. It's breadboards, nothing is need to be soldered. Some small PCBs to just for easy connection. And uh, yeah, I can, you can see it like it's a CPU, it's RAM and ROM, and it's video and keyboard controllers that uh, communicates with a TV set or PS2 uh, port. And also some uh, 74 uh, chips, logic, logical chips that helps to uh, work with the decoding and uh, for memory and for ports. Uh, and also uh, in this case, you can see a generator, this hard uh, at the bottom. It is just simple inverter uh, that is uh, with a capacitor and the resistor that just like work together to, to, to make a simple generator. But for sure, you can use also a, a, on an oscill oscillator that is just like crystal based that gonna give you one megahertz. And I'm gonna show it to you too. Yeah, and so basically the, the heart of every computer is like CPU and it's just uh, some, some chip that can as execute programs that are basically just a set of instructions. Every chip has its own set of instructions and uh, that is why you need to compile different sorts of uh, programs for a specific, we call it platform because chips, uh, CPUs, um, they have special codes and they are not interchangeable between them. Uh, but uh, but many uh, but they, but almost all the types of uh, CPUs use the main uh, sorts of instructions. It's just some kind of arithmetics. They can add uh, and uh, they can subtract. And, uh, now they can also multiply and divide because uh, in the in the first uh, CPUs there were not uh, such a possibility. They just need to do it uh, in their software the multiplication like many, many times of addition and so on. Some logical iterations with bits like and or and so on. Um, so, okay, so it can do something like a calculator. So the second time of uh, type of operations is read write to memory where it can fetch new command to execute and also can write some data and read some data from memory. And what is cool now, the main architecture of uh, computers or in computers is like where data and code layer all uh, in the same place. There is no any special chips just for code and uh, just for uh, data. It's all mixed up in if you see some printout of a, a memory dump, you don't really understand what it is. Is it a code or is it a, it is a some kind of a data? Uh, okay, so also it needs to communicate with a special version of a memory. So in some CPUs it is like, uh, the, you don't really see any difference. It's this, it is like this in the 6502. You don't really understand whether you write to some memory cell or you write to some port. But in some CPUs you do, like Intel 8080 and the Z80. Yeah, so it is some special cases for such a devices. And what is really, really uh, specific for, uh, for all the computers, it is jumps and calls for functions and uh, cycles. Because what is cool about uh, computers that it can do something very simple and just uh, uh, it described in an algorithm, but many, many, many times uh, in a second. And that, that was a key uh, for users them as a calculators for different sorts of actuations uh, and uh, for rockets and all this stuff, because uh, it's very hard to, for a person to solve, I don't know, 100,000 uh, actuations uh, trying to approach the solution and it's just very uh, tedious and people don't like uh, such a work but computers they like they can do cycle very 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 fast and uh, find the solution and that is how they 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 work and so yeah all the cpus they can do uh, this and in general you can generalize it's like cpus like has uh, three main buses like address bus where it can uh, set some address where he wants to read something or write something and depending on this it uh, on how many pins it has cpu or in, it depends how many uh how much memory it can address in in the case of 6502 it was 65 uh, 64 kilobytes and so it's uh it's a lot of memory in that time Data bus, it's a so-called uh, bus where you can you, you say like 8-bit 
16 bit and so bits and so on. So in this case, it, in, in the case of Apple one, it was eight bits uh, and it was typical for, for that time. And only at the, only at the end of the eighties, like uh, eight bit bits computers were kind of eight bit computers were kind of uh, becoming obsolete. And control bus is a signals that uh, CPU uses uh, to say that it wants to write or read or something like this. It's also all the interruptions with the CPU is also going on here. And so um, in our case, uh, with a, in our case, we don't use any interruptions. We just use this read and write signal to, to, to operate. And all, for example, here is one of the versions of our kit and uh, to work, you just need to connect uh, CPU in the bottom. Uh, you need to connect it to the two chips of uh, memory, the memory chips, and also to uh, force decoder and to uh, memory decoder because it uses uh, the last uh, it uses last uh, pins to um, to navigate which chip to use uh, RAM or ROM, and uh, for uh, ports it uses uh, first uh, first uh, it is first bits uh, to decode. Uh, the right port to use. You're gonna, I'm gonna show it to you in the in, in code. For data, we just uh, data bus is just a big bus because all the data is just like into uh, going between all these chips and only uh, synchronization uh, uh, by these decoders. They can uh, kind of semaphore what is just like active in the which chip is active in which period. Because otherwise, if you don't have such a decoding, just like nobody would know which flow is just like related to, to this chip. In this case, for example, D1 goes to memory chips and then D2 goes from one memory chip to the second and then uh, D3 goes to the video controller. And so video controller reads it uh, via the latch register and then it goes up to the video controller. And this, the uh, inverse logic is for the keyboard because you read keyboard. And uh, so first you get the uh, D5 from the keyboard controller and then it goes like from D6 to the main uh, data bus that it is inside, inside the computer. Um, yeah, and here's also what I wanna show. It's like uh, the, one of the versions of the memory map. Uh, it's not right like it was in the original uh, Apple one, but, it is, but in general, what is very uh, specific like it was in the original Apple one is like monitor is uh, at the end of the memory. Uh, so it's in the very, very high memory addresses. That was the specifics of the 6502 as I understand, because it runs not from the 0000, it's the first uh, com command it tries to execute but it uh, goes right to the end of the memory and reads the address from which it would uh, start the, the execution. And so this uh, monitor, so this operating system is right, right at, the high, um, at the high memory uh, addresses. A basic is typically put uh, to the E00 and uh, ports that, is, that, that are used to for communicating with, the, with uh, memory and of with the video on keyboard is on on on, on D. Uh, so okay, now I'm gonna show you what is uh, uh, to be clear. Okay, we have questions here. Uh, ah, do you? There's question. Do you actually own or do you know Apple One? That's cool. Uh, okay, now let me show you. Let me show you some code here um, from the original. Here where so this is original Steve's code in uh, 6502 assembler, and uh, here you can see uh, what we have it here. Uh, so we have ports like D11, D12, D13. This uh, here it's like they're used uh, in code, like here, and here, and here, and uh, hardwiring them and decoding them uh, in your computer. 
it gives you a link from from this software to the hardware so for example in this case um, what do we have here it's like it starts uh, from the reset because firstly we, we go here and we we, we see that uh, it, it goes to reset like interrupt vectors and then it starts executing here and uh, it set up the display and and uh, then it tries to uh, to read the what it is uh, firstly first of all it goes to the um, to the echo and tries to print here uh, according to this echo it prints the kind of a prompt like command line prompt uh, and uh, in this case uh, and then uh, also it tries to read the char that you wanna uh, that you wanna input and here's like uh, the other uh, stuff like run, you run the some program and also some uh, so, uh, some code for printing like byte or printing hex that is converting from, from, uh, from what is stored in the memory to the representation of the hex number. So it's very, very straightforward and uh, only, only thing it needs to know about the computer, it's just the codes for this uh, keyboard display and display uh, control registers, and, that, and then we decode them in the computer. So uh, let me show you, let me show you what also, under and the like clock well downside, the original Apple one is, is, is there is, is there any downside? Yeah, okay. Okay, yeah, let me show you also, what is, let me show you. And also maybe you have seen it. Uh, I need to turn, stop this, show some. No, yeah, here we are. And um, here's like the, the board with, with the Apple one, these uh, schematics that are shown already. It's like the CPU, these two memory, memory chips. And also it's like what is crucial, it's like keyboard and video controller that already goes there. But also what is cool, uh, we have it here. It's like the very simplified version of this. It's like when CPU is like the, the brain, it is in the center of the computer. So it's like ROM and RAM is just like here. Also we have a decoder here that is, uh, uh, gets the last uh, addresses uh, from the bus, and then it uh, generates a low signal to select one of the chips from here, uh, from memory or also from uh, from uh, from ports. Uh, also, you can have a oscillator like this, the square one, or we can oscillate with this inverter. Basically, you need two types of registers for to work with the uh, with the ports. It's like latch res register when you write some char to to video, because this is uh, how Apple One works. Uh, it works very straightforward. Just it echoes something one char at a time, and so it also reads uh, from keyboard one char at a time. And so it doesn't have any kind of a procedure to draw graphics. It doesn't have any procedure to clear uh, some specific uh, char at screen at the end of the screen. For example, it can clear only entire screen and then type something new one char at a time, a kind of a um, simplified but uh, very good work in design. So for this, we need register to uh, be able to respond only to um to when it is selected by ports and decoder for the ports when it knows uh, using the first uh, bits uh, from address line how to select uh, d11 or d12 or d10 that is uh, how it is done and so video and keyboard and in in case of apple one original apple one it had the shift register and some some extra chips and here's like now for example we can do it just with arduino like video one and keyboard uh, and for uh, for the low level uh, video, but for sure this uh, also what what can be done more 
uh, like in more Apple One style is just to have like also uh, Arduino to generate video signals uh, in high resolution and the uh, shift register to uh, like in the original Apple One. And also it was a lot of logic and uh, Steve said, uh, for example, now it also can be done like, like this, like NAND gates uh, to, because in, uh, here to, um, to encode and decode these uh, read and write signals. So uh, what are the boards between the chips and breadboard? Oh, okay, it's a small, okay. Okay, guys, it's also the question, what are the boards between the chips and breadboards? It's just small, small PCBs with the just inputs and outputs marked down to simplify the assembly. Uh, it doesn't have any black box here. So it's just uh, very straightforward and you can use it to, to assemble it very simple. Okay, and uh, so in general, uh, also you, what you can do, you can do it, for example, you can, uh, in the case of the TV out, you can, now you can, you can have it like here, for example. I can also can out it, for example, for some, you can out it for some version of a TFT screen. So, but at the logic of Apple one is still stands, stays the same. It just writes some chart to, to a port and then you can use any sort of driver, any sort of hardware to move this char to the some visible surface or TV or LCD or this big LCD or you can do it for this small OLED screen uh, and uh, yeah and so on. Also for the input you can use for example Bluetooth motor module using your phone or computer just without any wire to uh, just to give you one char at a time and then send this char to uh, to the computer. Does, dear Steve, does it look like uh, explanation of basics of a computer? Or uh, yes, oh yeah, yes. Very good, you had all the parts there. Somebody would almost have to spend some time to probably understand a lot of the, the pieces, what it is if they didn't have any background in it, but uh, that was the uh, the organization and the logic behind it all. Most of the chips on the Apple One were surprisingly in the video generator, but that has very little to do with the let's say the computer part of it, and mm -hmm. um, and of course there were some you know just due to resources and all that there were simple little things that could have been better. I explained how the keyboard was uppercase only, but also when I first wrote my um, um, my little 256 byte monitor program to give you a user with a keyboard some access over the, um, the, the computer data. I wrote two versions. One was a more correct version using interrupts. When you hit a key on the keyboard, it sends an interrupt signal that causes the, um, the Apple one to run some code to put the, the byte, whatever you typed into a memory to hold it. And the other version I wrote was just a simpler, pull the keyboard, wait for it when it's ready. A very safe routine, but not so proper. And I struggled the first night that I, you know, I had to go across the street, burn some proms one day. And then that night I kind of plugged them in. I tried to interrupt one for quite a long time. And interrupts can be a little tricky if you miss one step or get one slightly wrong on the processor. And I didn't get the interrupt version working. So I put in the pulled one and it worked and then I was happy. But uh, you, but what you've gone through, it looks like on all what you've been done going hooking through and making all those things work and programming it up, you've probably done more work than I did. Well, now it's much simpler. I mean, uh, just like in this case, it's just 15 chips. And uh, for a video, you don't need a lot of uh, stuff to do. You can use Arduino chip and just write something in C language. And uh, it's much simpler than write something in just uh, assembly language or just using machine language because yeah for sure I mean in your time it will you need to be kind of a really really great engineer to to understand all this and to write such a firmware I would say now it's yeah, just well I would I just firmware. took you know low-level chips that you could say were equivalent firmware but 
um, you know, and I just knew very quickly, okay, if you need to, uh, you know, shift register, you need to choose between two devices. These are the chips you use. And I could just, they just come out of my hand as fast as you could think it. But you had to sit down with your little ROMs, your little um, CPUs, um, those dialogue ones or whatever, and you had to write the software to do the equivalent of that. And I think your job was yeah. probably, might have been longer and harder. Who knows? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> it, it, yeah, Pro, may, may, maybe, yeah. But, but uh, also, so you had I to mean, repeat every step. You had to repeat every yeah. step and think it out. And the, the video had some stuff in it that was, I was, you know, so tricky at saving, you know, a quarter of a chip here and there. The video still confuses me to this this day. <laughs> yeah, and so what is cool? I mean, uh, for example, if you use, uh, if, I mean, uh, what is what I like about what I like in Apple One that you can just, you know, as you your uh, operating system is just uh, writes. It's very simple and it's good for education because it uh, just writes some char to to a port and it reads some char and then you can give any any type of uh, uh, hardware to provide this chart for these uh, ports to be written or uh, to be read or to be written to some some device and that is very cool because I think uh, kids and uh, geeks can just create a lot of uh, all fun versions of their own computers because yeah I can they can use uh, some some Bluetooth or some other technologies just to to send some some charts Wi-Fi maybe probably because it doesn't really have any limitations and still every, all this stuff would be working and you can run all the 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 original games for example yeah in our case we can run uh, this game of life where it's just like you look at these cells how do they uh how do they live in the, in time and that, that is also fun and also you can run basic and in general can understand what all this uh is working because for sure now i mean to understand how for example some some operating system is working you need to to read some some very tough book to understand all these yes for people who just are maybe young and learning you know like i was in my life um learning new mathematics or learning new technology issues or how computers work is an exciting thing not for everyone let's say but everybody's got their own things they're most interested in but it's hard to go back and learn a lot of these basic principles of what the pieces of a computer are and how they work at a simple low level. It's very hard these days. So I'm very glad to see um, all sorts of projects and kits online and, you know, even things with the small processors, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and all that. That's no. the, the real purpose that's good for them is it's easier for people to learn when they're young, you know, the, the elements of a world that now is just commonplace. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, and also I want to say thank you for your explanation because it's uh, just like I think for everybody in this room, it's just uh, great uh, information, very interesting, and uh, communicating with you is just, uh, I think it's a very supportive and during these hard times when you sit at home for so many, many days and you just, uh, when people can use something from the person like you, the legendary engineer. So yeah, I think it's very, very, very supportive and very cool. And for yeah. me personally, I go, it's very I go cool. back to the Apple one, the Apple two and things I can feel from firsthand experience. And I often realize that it's, you know, a lot of great things come more from wanting than they come from even necessarily knowledge and thinking it out or because thinking it out is often to look at what we have now, how can I improve it? That's often incremental. But you know, wanting something that doesn't exist—that's uh, that's a key element that we sometimes we kind of push it out of young people to think outside of the box when they're young. You get better grades if you think the same as everyone else. Yeah, and uh, also, by the way, do wouldn't you mind if I show you our packaging of this, uh, all this, all this stuff? How do we package it? Would love to see. Okay, so. Here's the packaging we introduced uh, at CES. And so it's like, it's, a, it's like holes of the breadboard. So it's like, that's why it's like very black and, and square. And uh, it, it's, it's all about the uh, chips, people. And in general, what you have here, it's like this. So it's a big, 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 big uh, Eva with the uh, chips. 
so we can take it and uh, see what all, all these components are. So we have small stickers right there. And now we have in the stickers, we plan to put it uh, stickers uh, that you can really stick to your chips to understand what they do. And uh, here it's like original uh, 6502, you can still have them. Uh, maybe, you know, the guys also, they produce it in the US, uh, in Arizona, Bill mentioned uh, his team, they also produce it. And uh, so now it's all, they're still available. Also, this uh, RAM, uh, RAM and ROM chips, and all this small logic for uh, working with this. And two Arduino chips that could be used also after you build your Apple One to to re reprogram them for your project. Also, like here, it's like the these bags anti-static with the components and wires, and also breadboards to assemble all this. So yeah, we just wanted to, to follow your philosophy with this uh, kind of a simplicity and uh, and uh, letting people to touch uh, some legendary computer that shaped our world, I would say, and uh, to learn the basics of computer because uh, I think it's the best tool uh, tool right now to to explain how, how it works. And also you can, you have a lot of also kind of um, manuals and documents uh, on the web where you can read the, the original story and you can get this owner's manual and it all, everything gives you kind of this garage spirit of the first pioneers of pioneers of the computing. So I think that is also very cool when you can do something now that is linked to the beginning of the computing and uh, that is still applicable to the things uh, that are working around you because now kind of billions of computers around us and it's more and more of them, and but nobody really knows how do they work. Also, it was a question also about the WDC. Uh, yeah, it was a question about uh, from uh, Kurt Samson about the do we use uh, WDC? Well, we can we plan to use both of them. We kind of we plan to get have a version with the, this WDC and uh, chips and also uh, just ordinary chips. They're not made in Arizona. Okay, maybe is there some questions to... Okay, so uh, I think maybe Steve, there is a question, a kind of a just general one. If you can answer this, uh, maybe you can, people would be happy. They're asking about something new from, uh, just like they're asking about the and also the question do you have already a really a own original apple one i do have one original apple one left i even got to a point where one time i remember going online and buying an apple one for $40,000, that was a long time ago, so I could donate it to a museum. I never gave up mm -hmm. one of my um, Apple Ones. Now my main Apple One that I use, my personal Apple One, my Apple Two, my Apple Three, my Lisa, my Macintosh, all these Apple devices that were my own, I uh, donated them to a local college where I went to for a year. You know, I honor all the institutions of my life that helped get me where mm -hmm. I, I got to. And they have it on display there. They have a display of all my original, my computers. Yeah. It was a question. Ah, it was an anonymous at an at an D. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, if you want, I we can send you also this kit. Maybe you would have the new Apple One in the new version, this twentieth twenty first century version of your Apple One. If you want to, we can send you one. Now you should charge me full price. I don't like to take advantage of privileges. Okay, that's not a problem. <laughs> okay. Okay. I mean, in general, if you want to, we can. Yeah, we can do it. Discuss it after this. Okay, uh, so it was also the question. Ah, it was a question about when we would ship. Okay, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a good question. We would, would ship it like finally because, yeah, we want to make it perfect. And uh, it seems that we need to stop someday <laughs> and very soon to ship it faster. Because, you know, Steve, as engineers, we try to know to make it. You see, it like, uh, for example, if it's not clear, we try to make a new version of PCB, small PCB, that all these inputs would be just more neat and you can understand better what is input, what is output, and all this stuff. 
yeah but uh, any anyway i think we, we should stop yeah okay uh i think uh maybe it was like also a question about sergio uh about the is it possible to emulate apple 2 on S esp32 i don't know i haven't investigated on this really but probably some 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 kind of emulation maybe is possible yeah i don't i don't really know this um okay um okay 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 uh so yeah steve i think uh yeah it's uh all the stuff i wanted to show i just showed and did and explained uh, maybe we would do something more um uh, kid kids friendly i mean uh, like these webinars in explaining um uh, computers in more uh kind of uh, um simple ways and uh, for sure want to say thank big thank you for you for joining to us because everybody here is just like happy to to hear your voice and uh, hear your explanations and uh, for sure uh, happy birthday to you as a father of all these beautiful computers apple ones that just even 40 and something years after the birth they're still still popular among the many people that's very very nice of you <laughs> thank you so maybe some yeah, so we're gonna say thank you guys. Thank you guys for joining. Hope this that it was a good day for you and uh, maybe this uh, would help you to be even more safe and sound during these times. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye, Steve. Bye.